For those of you that don't know who I am, uh, I'm, I'm Rick O'Connor. I'm the executive director of the RISC-V Foundation. And it's an absolute thrill to be here this week uh, with our friends from the Barcelona Supercomputing Center and uh, the Universitat Politecnico de Catalunya as our hosts. And we'll talk more about that tomorrow when we open the, the formal two-day workshop. Uh, this afternoon, and we've done this at previous workshops, um, the, the day before we, we kind of host these educational tutorial sessions to give people who might be new to RISC-V a little bit of an overview of where it came from, the different parts of the spec that are being worked on actively. So my, my talk is a quick introduction to the actual ISA, very quick, uh, as well as a little bit of an overview of the foundation itself. And I get, we get this a lot, who's using it and where they're using it. I've got a couple of use case examples from um, Western Digital and NVIDIA. And this is, I'm allowed to talk about this because they already have. So before I get uh, any further, before you've found or you know, received an email to register for this event, prior to that occurring, how many of you had heard of RISC-V before? That, this is great, because in the first couple of workshops, when we asked that question, there'd be like me and all the guys from UC Berkeley would hold up their hands. Uh, so OK, so you've heard of it. Great. How many of you have downloaded the spec? OK, less hands. How many of you have read the spec that you downloaded? OK, <laughs> less hands. How many of you are actively working on a RISC-V implementation? Oh, that's pretty good. That's awesome. How many of you have been to all the workshops? Hey. <laughs> OK. So this started in 2010. Uh, the team at UC Berkeley was looking for um, a, next, a, a, a next topic around which to build their, their educational program, um, both at the graduate and undergraduate level. Clearly, they've done a lot of risk-based research, as most of you know. Hey, a couple of commercial options, x86 and ARM. Primarily, both way too big and way too complex to use. Uh, obviously, some IP issues. So hey, they said, well, you know what? We've done this before a bunch of times. Why don't we crank out a three-month project and be ready for the fall semester uh, later that year? And this was back in May of 2010. Well, that three-month project turned into, four years later, um, the publication of the original base spec. Um, and, and several, several tape-outs, many publications along the way. And one of the things that became obvious as they kept you know, publishing the research was there were more followers out there in industry and other academics than they had realized. Because when they would change something, the team would get feedback, say, hey, you can't change that. This is really important. I like what you did there. And if you change it, it breaks this and this and this. So it became obvious that this needed to exist as a project outside of the four walls of Berkeley. And in the summer of 2015, uh, sorry, August of 2015, yeah, we created the RISC-V Foundation. And so the V, as you all know, is not a V. It's Roman numeral five, as in the fifth generation of risk research out of the team at UC Berkeley. Uh, originally under uh, uh, Patterson's work back in the 80s, which was Risk one Soar and Spur were kind of posthumously named three and four, just so that we have a continuous Risk, risk five through uh, Risk one through Risk five So we created the, uh, the foundation, and um, now that you know sort of the origin around the V, you are all ambassadors of the Risk five brand. When you hear a colleague or someone who's new to the technology call it Risk v you gently reach out, you tap them on the shoulder, you say, hey, no, no, mate, that's risk five. OK? So you, it's your responsibility to do that going forward. So why do we care about instruction sets? I mean, geez, it's an instruction set after, after all. A couple of points. So 99% clearly of all of the laptops that we use um, are x86-based. And what's interesting is it's not even Intel's x86. The, all, the vol bulk of the volume is shipped by Intel, but the actual 64-bit ISA came from AMD. There's a whole history lesson as to why that happened. Then on the mobile side, despite all that volume on the x86 side for some, for, for some very well-known reasons, this is pretty much all ARM-based. And why is an Intel really able to sell into the mobile market? This is changing, but it's taken a heck of a long time, and it's really only a tip of the iceberg. But why are there not ARM devices in, in, uh, in server space? And how is IBM still selling mainframes? <laughs> Fundamentally, 
The ISA is the most important interface in a computer system, right? It's where hardware meets software. And, it, and it's because of that that instruction sets really do matter. So if that's the case, why does pretty much every other interface in the computing systems we build have open standards associated with them? When the, we've just sort of agreed that the ISA is the most important one, and it doesn't. There's, there's standards for very, pretty much everything else from networking right through to operating systems and everything in between, but not for an ISA. Hello. Here we go. Let's just make sure I didn't miss one. Okay. So let's take the, um, a large SOC as an example. So this is a, a, a Tegra uh, SOC from NVIDIA. And like most SOCs, there are dozens of cores on this SOC. And arguably, they're all different from an ISA standpoint. They're certainly different from an application in terms of how they're used and what they do. Many of the cores uh, are not even visible as a, a programmable interface to the user. Um, those APIs are not exposed. It's firmware that you know, the developer loads on them to implement a specific function for you. The application processor obviously gets exposed for the very uh, you know, graphics processor uh, intention of, of, of this device. But there's everything from control processors for power, there's security processors, there's going to be a bunch of different radios, and they're all different ISAs. And most of the, um, most of the reason for the difference has to do with the legacy of how that stuff got integrated from discrete architectures as opposed to starting out with a blank slate. If we were systems engineers and we had a blank slate and we were going to build a complex SOC like this from scratch without any legacy IP to, to worry about either from a software standpoint or a hardware standpoint, there's no way we would come up with this architecture. If we did, we should be shot. Do we really need them all to be different? Arguably, we don't. And certainly, they don't need to be proprietary. So what if? What if we had an ISA that was purpose-built and architected from the beginning to be able to address all of those requirements and needs? Well, lucky us, right? So obviously, we think that the RISC-V ISA is exactly that. So what's different at a high level? It's far smaller. It's very simple. Uh, it's, it's compartmentalized, as we'll see. It's a clean slate design. So clearly, from, from a history standpoint, you know, it's informed by the fact that there's decades of research of what has gone well in, in risk uh, architectures, maybe what has gone not so well. So uh, you know, with, that, with that hindsight, being able to come up with a, a new and, and uh, um, efficient design is good. This is probably the part that's most unique. It's modular, right? So, uh, as you've seen, the extensions allow you to use the part portion of the ISA that you need to use in your device, right from a deeply embedded IoT device through to a superscalar machine. And we have lots of examples in the ecosystem of people uh, using the ISA at implementation points all the way along that performance spectrum. And building on that modularity, it's designed to be extensible and, and specific uh, in uh, in particular for specialization, right? So part of the modularity portion is, you know, reserved opcode space for user-defined extensions. So if you want to roll your own secret sauce into a handful of custom instructions to implement a purpose-built accelerator for, a, you know, a, a specific data set that you're trying to uh, work on efficiently, the ISA supports that very nicely. And stable. The way that we bring new functionality into the ISA, and there's been a lot of discussion about this on uh, some of the forums, and that's okay, right? The, being open means we get to talk about everything, um, is introducing new functionality through adding new extensions, not through revising older extensions. So when you, when you have published, when we have published and frozen extensions in the spec space, um, and you build a device on that, you can rely on that to not move, right? It'll change, it will not change, it will stay stable, and your device will run those instructions in perpetuity. So as I said, it's, it's extensions-based. Um, here's a, here's a, a, a quick list of, of uh, some of the more popular extensions, and there's more being worked on, obviously. Um, the M for integer, A is for atomic, and the floating point with double and quad precisions, uh, and so on. 
And for those of you that have, you know, maybe similar to my vintage and are familiar with what a green card is, it's kind of interesting to appreciate the simplicity of the instruction set by building out a green card. So a green card, back in, back in the days of main, IBM mainframes, and for those of you that might remember DEC PDP-8s and PDP-11s and so on with the bootstrap switches on the front, you had a little card that you could literally fold up and stuff in your pocket that had all of the assembly instructions for that machine. Right? So that's, that's what the green card is. And just for illustration purposes, we'll go ahead and build it out. So here's the integer instructions in 32-bit mode, add 14 uh, mode for privilege, sorry, 14 more instructions for privilege, eight more for multiply divides, add in the atomics, um, and then the, the floating point, uh, double and quad precision, uh, the comp compressed mode, and then add in 64-bit and 128-bit variants. And there's your green card. So it's not meant to be legible really here, although it is, but certainly you can print this out on one 8.5 by 11 sheet and have all of the instructions that are currently defined in the standard. It's, it's really quite elegant. OK, that's sort of the Reader's Digest tour of the history of the ISA and where it came from. For those of you that are familiar with the Patterson and Hennessy uh, textbooks, uh, right? The, it, the, uh, there's now a RISC-V edition, as well as a nice little companion uh, textbook, uh, uh, or a companion manual that uh, Dave and, and Andrew Waterman actually wrote. And what's really cool, uh, given that we're here in, in Spain, La versión en español es disponible, right? So there's been a, tr a, 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 a translation that's been done uh, as a co colaboración entre UC Berkeley y Universidad Galileo en Guatemala. And that Mona Lisa puppy on the right uh, has, has been translated as available as of the 2nd of May for free for download uh, on at the link there, the RISC V book site. So it's quite a nice little companion mode. It's, it's pretty cool, and I'm sorry if I butchered that reading. I did my best. They don't really teach me Spanish in Canada. OK, so quick foundation overview, very quick. So we created the organization in the summer of 2015. There's a whole series of uh, membership agreement and bylaws that have been specified and ratified uh, by the original group. The, the main reason for the foundation, don't, don't, you, can, you can certainly call me looking for RISC-V IP and cores, but that's not what the foundation does. I'll direct you out to members who, who might have that. We look after the specs and only the specs. That could change over time, but as it, as it stands now, the, the foundation is responsible for uh, the specs as well as the compliance test suites um, that will protect, if you will, the sanctity of a single standard. And with, with that, we attach the RISC-V trademark. So as a member, you get license to the trademark. And the, real, the only purpose for that is we all want to know what it means when I hold up my hand and I say, I've got a RISC-V compliant device, say, an IMAFD compliant device. What does that actually mean? So we're, we're, we're going to use the, uh, we're using the trademark as a means of helping to try to guarantee that there is the sanctity of a single standard in the marketplace. Oh, this will take a while, probably. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> Every time I put this slide up, it's out of date. And it's already out of date. We have more than 150 members. That's inclusive of individual members and corporate members. You'll be able to get copies of all these slides. You don't have to take pictures and everything. So as, as of the end of March, uh, we're over 150. This growth has been crazy. Uh, it doesn't appear to be slowing down. And that's close to 100 organizational members. Um, and, uh, and as I said, uh, this includes the individual members. So I just thought I'd throw that up, because it's uh, with, with the Barcelona Supercomputing uh, Center being our latest member, uh, we're we now have a member in Spain. And that's 25 countries that the foundation is in around the world, representing about half the world's population. I'm not trying to suggest that half the world's population is using a RISC-V device yet. OK, uh, we have board of directors, technical committee, marketing committee. For those of you that are members and are hanging around for the Thursday meetings, there's a bunch of task group meetings uh, underway. And there's all defined in terms of uh, what we do and how we interact. 
Here's our, our board. Most of the guys, I think, are going to be here this week. In fact, there's a few in the room now. So if you haven't met any of these fellows yet, they're, they're, they're cool guys. Uh, you know, take the opportunity this week while, while you're here to uh, seek them out. And if you're looking for anyone in particular and you don't know who they are, you know, just come and tap me on the shoulder and I'll, I'll point them out and make an introduction for you. Lots of workshops, right? Gazillion workshops. This is our third largest workshop uh, after the one that we had in the Bay Area uh, just, just last fall and uh, the one that we had at Google before that. So the Bay Area ones, Bay Area ones continue to be the, the, the larger of them. We've got about 101 companies represented uh, and amongst the attendees over the course of the week and more than 25 universities. So that's pretty cool. And I'm not going to have enough time to go through these, but I'm going to go real quick. NVIDIA is using uh, RISC-V as a uh, replacement for one of their internal control processors called Falcon. And they did a, without us knowing, this is before they joined, without anybody knowing, they didn't even really reach out to the UC Berkeley guys that much. They just used the stuff that was available online. They did their own internal comparison and analysis of a core they could build using the ISA. Because um, their internal control processor, processor called Falcon was a homegrown risk device that they had developed before. They needed to upgrade it to 32-bit, from 32-bit to 64. The conclusion they came up with, and these, and these are specs that they can talk about publicly because the, the specs are public. They compared it to other cores as well without public, where the data is not public. But the conclusion they came to was everything that they would, wanted to do, RISC-V would be the only device, only ISA that would allow them to meet all of the requirements uh, that they have. They also um, estimated that they ship uh, around three quarters of a billion of these cores today. So they're, they're replacing uh, a core that's, you know, that's in production now with a new RISC-V architecture. They'll, they'll announce when this thing has actually uh, hit the market. Western Digital, a very similar story. Martin Fink is actually here this week. He'll be giving an update on this. But he, uh, he, he announced this, uh, this data point last November. Uh, he talked about the notion of big data, fast data. You know, fast data being the, my autonomous car is going through the intersection right now. I've got a decision to make in a big hurry whether or not I'm going to hit something. Should I go? Should I stop? What is it? Big data being things like genomics and everything in between. And you know, Western digital devices have to cover the waterfront in terms of storage architectures to satisfy those requirements. And they see RISC-V as an opportunity to develop a single ISA and build cores around that to satisfy all of those needs. They made the comment that today they ship around a billion cores a year in all of their storage devices, and that they will be uh, doubling and tripling that over the next few years, and all of that will be converted to RISC-V. So they're very, very supportive of you know, the ecosystem and have a strong and active engagement in, in helping to develop that further. So with that, I hope you think this is interesting. I think most of you do, because that's why you're here. The momentum is staggering. If you haven't followed us already on Twitter and the LinkedIn page, do so. Uh, if you feel like going to the south of India in July, uh, our next workshop uh, is going to be hosted by the IIT Madras team um, uh, in uh, July 18th and 19th. And that's it for me. I'm over time, and I think Andrew is up next. So I'm around, obviously, all week. You can see me during the break if you have questions. And thanks for your attention.